the thinking atheist, Seth Andrews, come on over here. He is an author, a speaker, a podcaster. Oh, sorry about that close up. A podcaster um, and a friend of mine. May I have a hug, Seth? All right, take it away. Hi, everybody. I was cute. Yeah, I brought a timer, but I'll tell you, I have a tight 29 and a half minutes to me. So if you bring the hook out, I will go on the radio and say disparaging things about you. I promise. How many podcast listeners do we have in the room? Thank you very, very much. We are on track in the next three months, I think, to cross two million downloads a month on that radio show. Is that crazy? Thank you. And not just atheists are listening. A lot of people of various faiths are, are sort of hanging out in the uh, wings and listening to the conversation. Yeah, I'm a former Christian broadcaster. I was um, on one of the most popular Christian radio stations in the country back in the 90s, and I was raised in a Christian home where we were surrounded by Christian music. Amy Grant, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Michael W. Smith. Anybody else know the artist I'm talking about? There's three of you. Come on, you got to own that. All right? And I'm a child of the 80s. Any 80s children here? Well, you probably remember these guys. But, well, they're still around, but it's Motley Crue from the hairband era. Quiet Riot and the album Bang Your Head. And, of course, White Snake was another big sort of 80s, 90s phenomenon. Well, in Christianity, we were terrified that our young people were becoming so involved in pop culture. After all, rock music is about what? Getting laid. This is sex out of marriage. It's terrible. Oh, they're doing drugs? That's even worse. We need a Christian alternative. So Christian music went in and put together their own, uh, there's poison, their own hair band. This is a band called Bloodgood, named after the bass player and founder, Michael Bloodgood. Here's one of the album covers. Uh, it's about Jesus' blood. His blood brought goodness to all of us. They're still around. They just celebrated their 25th anniversary. They're still rocking. We had a band called Holy Soldier. Here's one of my favorites from the 80s, Baron Cross. How badass are these looking, these cats here, right? White spandex and white gloves, and their hot single called We Will Rock for the King. And of course, you can't talk about 80s and 90s hair bands without talking about Striper. <laughs> the yellow and black attack. They were cool for about five minutes in the 80s. Of course, their name comes from Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. With his stripes, or by his stripes, we are healed. Now, they would go and do these concerts, right? And they're rocking for Jesus, man. We're going to guitar solo and drum solo for Jesus, man. It's going to be awesome. And then they would bring these Bibles, and they would chuck these things out into the audience during the show had the Striper logo on them, and that was part of their shtick. Now, I'm going to play you a quick song and video clip from some Striper, some classic Striper, because I want to transport you back in time so you're going to feel what it was like to, like, rock for the king, okay? This is from a band, uh, a song called Soldiers Under Command. Now, the lyrics, to be clear, are, we're fighting all the sin, and the good book says we'll win, and the chorus is, we are soldiers Soldiers under command. Now, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, you're thinking, hey, this is Spinal Tap. <laughs> I have to resist the urge to remind these guys of their own holy book they're throwing into the audience. Does not the very nature of things teach you that a man has long hair? It is a disgrace to him. Now, this was a, a, a strategic thing in the church. If there was something going on in the world, we had to have a Christian version of it. And this is part of the insular nation, nature of the church. You guys have seen this, right? We don't want them not participating in the world. How do we build a wall around them? Well, if they've got that, we've got this. There is a book by a guy named Phil Chalmers 
called I Don't Listen to the Official, I Don't Listen to the Lyrics Handbook. What he did was he wrote a book where he found what was hot on pop radio and he found the Christian equivalent and he charted it. You like Sheryl Crow, you like Susan Ashton, you like uh, Sting, you like Stephen Curtis Chapman. How they got that correlation, I have no idea. You know, if you like uh, Enya, you like Iona, right? There's a whole bunch of these types of comparisons. And you can see them borne out. Now, many of these examples do come from the 80s and 90s, the formative years of contemporary Christian music, which I can best speak to, but I guarantee this still goes on today. This, of course, is the uh, trio Wilson Phillips, right? Hugely big in the 90s. Well, Christian music needed our own Wilson Phillips, and guess what? We had it. Their name was Sierra, packaged exactly the same way, and their vocal sound was just like Wilson Phillips. Boy band like NSYNC, well, we can do it Jesus style with groups like this one. Here's Plus One and The Promise. Take a look at Sheila Walsh from the Don't Hide Your Heart album. Any of you 80s and 90s children know who she might be the equivalent of? How about Sheena Easton? Now take a look, right? Sheila Walsh, tell me that's a coincidence, right? Stevie Nicks, famous as a solo artist and for her work with Fleetwood Mac. She's produced over 40 top 50 hits and sold over 140 million albums. She is a legend. Oh shit, she's also a witch, right? That's what they told us in the church. You realize she's a witch? I don't know. I, I, okay, she wore black. There's proof. Well, <laughs> Leslie Phillips sort of became, in a way, our Stevie Nicks. This is her from the Black and White in a Gray World album. And she was kind of a one-two punch because she sounded a little bit like Cyndi Lauper. So she had the look of two different artists. In fact, her own record label promoted her as the Christian Cyndi Lauper. Hey, if you like her, well, you'll love the Jesus version over here. And here's a clip and see if you can catch the Cyndi Lauper vibe they were going for. <laughs> I can't subject you to any more of that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you too much. Um, uh, to her credit, she was angry at the fact that they were trying to put her in this cookie cutter, right? She was there because we needed a Cindy Lauper, Stevie Nicks, and she, was, she said, no, I want to be who I am. So she rebranded herself, she changed her name to Sam Phillips, and she went out and had a successful solo career on her own terms and good for her. Weird bit of trivia. If you've ever seen the Bruce Willis flick Die Hard 3, Die Hard with a Vengeance, and you see Jeremy Irons' henchwoman, the woman with the blade who never speaks a word but is deadly, that's Leslie Phillips from Christian Music. <laughs> the whole time they're doing the uh, warehouse scene where Jeremy Irons and her are about to have sex in the warehouse, I'm like, that's Leslie Phillips. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> Here's a guy who is uh, one of, I, I kid you not, one of the great guitar players in the world. Phil Kagey, this is from his 1980 Flipside album. And I kid you not, the guy is a, he's a, a master at the guitar. Well, the wild part is he lost one of his fingers in an accident when he was a kid. He, they, they were at a, on a farm and there was a pump handle and it literally cut his finger off. With nine fingers, he's become a virtuoso guitarist. But he also has a unique vocal sound that may not be all that unique. Listen. The day is gone, but you carry on, watching the day into the dawn. Now, who are you catching a little vibe of there? I don't know, maybe just a little Paul McCartney, right? Just a little bit? Here's one of the most blatant examples. A guy named Phil Driscoll, this is from a classic album, came out in 1983 called I Exalt Thee. Now, the guy is a masterful trumpet player. I'm not trying to take away from the talents of these artists. They're genuinely talented people. But he had a vocal sound that sounded exactly like Joe Cocker, right? Or almost exactly like. And so I was looking around, and I found they both cover the song You Are So Beautiful in concert. And I found them both doing the song live, and I juxtaposed segments from each to each other. Now, Joe Cocker singing to a woman, 
Phil Driscoll singing to God. Check this out. You are so beautiful. To me, you are so beautiful. Same key, even. To me, can just see. This continued through the 80s, 90s, and continues to a degree today. Creed was huge, right? In the 90s, well, we had our own sort of Creed band. Mac Powell sang lead for a band called Third Day. Honestly, they're talented guys. They've got a pretty good sound. But they were the sort of the equivalent. Groups like TLC, kind of the urban group, we had Out of Eden. Uh, it's a trio packaged exactly the same way. Here's one of the most blatant examples of Christianity ripping off what was hot in pop culture. Anybody old enough to remember We Are the World from 1985, the anthem for uh, uh, USA for Africa? What happened was is that Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones, and several other people organized an aid relief effort to benefit the hungry in Africa and in the United States. Now, this thing was huge. To date, one of the most popular radio singles ever created. 20 million copies, over $63 million raised. Now, I was in Christian culture at the time, and Christian music had a huge red face over all of this because this essentially is missions work that's supposed to be done by actual missionaries. Instead, Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones did it. So these guys ran into the studio, they got a bunch of artists together, and they did a multi-artist anthem. This came out the very same year, just a few months later. It was called Do Something Now. Now, they even ripped off the video. Here's a clip from We Are The World. And here is a clip from the cause, Do Something Now. I remember reading an article, I don't know if it was in Charisma magazine or CCM magazine, they were talking about how even the artists in the studio that day recording were embarrassed that pop music had done first what they were now imitating. It was a shameless copy. And that continues today. For example, if you go to any one of many Christian retailers around the country, you can buy a t-shirt that looks like this. Hunger for God. I don't know, what does that look like? Maybe the Hunger Games? Even has the bird, right? Here's another Christian t-shirt being sold at retailers. Being angry is for the birds. Be happy. What do you think this Christian t-shirt's ripping off? Called to duty? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Here's a ripoff of the Starbucks logo, Sacrifice for Me. Look how blatant that is. Is that crazy? Somebody took the Subway logo his way. There are t-shirts for sale at Christian retailers that have the easy button from Staples and it says, Jesus, it's just that easy. Life's problems, one solution. God wants you to be saved. I'm going to come back to YouTube here in just a second. 
They ripped off the American Idol logo, Amazing Grace, I don't need an idol, I have a savior. Same font, same style, same sizing. They even ripped off Coca-Cola. <laughs> Jesus Christ eternally refreshing. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Now, we're all probably on the same page here. How are they getting away with this? How are they getting away with this? Well, there was an article in 2009 about this very subject in USA Today. And it said this, American retailers sell about 4.6 billion worth of Christian products annually. Some are spoofs or spinoffs of commercial logos or brand names. Many such goods are illegal, trademark attorneys say, but companies are often unaware their names are being copied or they don't put up a fight for fear of being labeled anti-faith. How about some more examples? You guys like the classic best-selling board game Monopoly? No, you, you, want to, you want to land on biblical properties, let's play Bibleopoly. I'm guessing it comes with a get out of hell free card. I'm just... <laughs> Superheroes are big these days, but they possess powers not given by God or Jesus or the Bible. So how about a Christian alternative? Well, here's an example. The almighty hero's action figure. This is Samson. Barbie? Barbie's not of God. We need a Christian alternative to Bobby, Barbie. In fact, you can find these dolls. They're called God's Girls. Sarah, Abigail, and Hannah. You'll see Sarah there on the right-hand side of the graphic. My name means princess. I really am a princess because my father's the king of kings. I love dancing and praising God. Of course, if you're going to price these dolls biblically, the women must be worth half that of what the men are worth. <laughs> Dance party games, huge bestsellers on computers and Wii and PlayStation, Xbox. Here's one, Just Dance 3. Here's Guitar Hero. Anybody like to play Guitar Hero? Well, here we've got Guitar Praise <laughs> with Jesus music. And here's the Dance Praise remix with Jesus music. Stephen King, one of the best-selling fiction authors of all time. There is a Christian equivalent of Stephen King. His name is Frank Peretti. With more than 15 million novels in print, he's been called a sanctified Stephen King. Supernatural thrillers along the Stephen King vein. And just as an object lesson, the top row of books are Stephen King books, the bottom are Frank Peretti. Look how similar even the artwork is. You like romance novels? Here's a couple of steamy ones like Wicked Little Secrets, Scoundrels Captive. Well, we need a Christian version of these. How do we pull that off? <laughs> well, they exist. 60 Acres and a Bride is one of them I found. I was just, it's a weird Google search to do, by the way. But <laughs> it felt kind of dirty, you know, it's weird. Redeeming love. I'm get, all of these, by the way, are PG, which means there's no tongue and they, all the hands are all around the waist or whatnot. You guys follow wrestling? WWE Raw. Believe it or not, there is a Christian wrestling federation. <laughs> these guys tour the country. And on their website it says, the Bible says we're to use unique and different ways to reach people for Christ. Right? Our goal is to convert them to Christ's love. Yes, we're going to kick the shit out of each other for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Anybody old enough to remember the power team? They were a big uh, deal in the, the 80s. Right? These big uh, bodybuilder strongman guys would go all around. They'd tour the country and they did feats of quote-unquote strength. They'd bend the metal bar and they'd tear the phone books in half. And at the end, after they'd entertained the crowd, they ham-handedly sort of segued into a Jesus message and actually had an altar call right there. These guys in these big tank tops with arms like this, and they're giving the altar call. Go figure. Anybody remember in the 80s during the height of satanic panic the warnings about dungeons and dragons? <laughs> right? 
You're not just playing a wizard, you're opening a portal to dark spiritual energy. You actually become a wizard. You might even become possessed by the devil. Here's a 1983 incarnation of advanced D&D. Well, it's not enough that the church must condemn dungeons and dragons. Hey, let's make an alternative. Here's Dragon Raid, building warriors for spiritual battle. Magic the Gathering, very popular game, but look at all this sorcery going on. Christianity stole this idea. They have a game called Redemption, where the characters are like King Saul and Deborah. There are even angels involved in this particular game. A blatant, blatant ripoff of what was a creative idea. YouTube is hugely popular, but you know, there's so much sin and, and there's so much sexuality and there's so much just, you know what, we need an alternative. God Tube. <laughs> their slogan is Broadcast Him. This is their actual home page. The categories include music videos, ministry videos, inspirational uh, comedy, cute videos, and even full sermons on God Tube. Social media, that's a trap door. Instead of using a site like Facebook, why not try the Christian faith book? <laughs> My favorite part of this page is the disclaimer. It says, Christian faith book is not a Facebook clone, but it offers all the same features as Facebook that everybody uses. eHarmony, the big dating site? Well, of course, we all make fun of ChristianMingle.com. That's right, God's master plan for you to find your soulmate is to sign up to a website. you got to be kidding me. Music festivals like Lollapalooza, right? People love live music. Well, there's plenty of creation, uh, creation fest type of uh, Christian music festivals, many of them going on for full weekends or even a week long. This one is called Creation Festival. You'll see actually on the banner over the uh, stage, uh, is it a tribute to our creator? My screen's a little bit, uh, but the whole thing is just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Don't go to Lollapalooza. Don't go to this concert. Don't go here. Come to us. We are your full service ministry headquarters. It gets ridiculous. For example, don't freshen your breath with Wrigley's extra mints. Try testaments. <laughs> this is a real product sold in Christian retail stores worldwide with scriptures on each one and a cross embossed on each mint. You like Disneyland or Disney World? I'm not sure I can support Disney as a person of faith, so let's go less than 20 miles down the road from Disney World to the Holy Land Experience, complete with activities for the young children, including my favorite, the execution of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Your kids will love it. I'm trying to picture the souvenir shop shit they're trying to pitch to these children. We live in a fitness culture. Stuff like the insanity workout and so many others are hugely popular. But you know what? God created our bodies, and therefore we must work out his way. There are many examples of this, including this one by a guy named Dr. Ben Lerner, Body by God. Extreme makeover, God's way. Now, I love this example because it's hugely telling. Essentially, you do all the work and you give God all the credit, which is exactly what the church does with everything else. There's the body gospel. On this book called Fit for Eternal Life, the back cover actually says this. I'm going to try to read it to you. It says, is your spirit faithful? but your flesh flabby? <laughs> Has your temple of the Holy Spirit begun to creak and crumble? Then let Fit for Eternal Life show you how to build it up again. Check out this blast from the past. Is that awesome or what? <laughs> the firm believer. <laughs> and this last fitness example, because of what the woman is holding in her hands, is the most unintentionally funny promotional photograph of the decade. It's cardio praise with fit sticks. 
Of course, it's Easter weekend. You don't do Easter candy. You need to buy Jesus Promise Seeds. Do you guys get that vibe that, like, this is the temple and these are the money changers? Jesus is hugely profitable. Now, religion has a long history of stealing some of the coolest ideas. A great example, of course, is the Halloween holiday, right? It's said to have originated with the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain, which took place on the eve of the new year. Back then, it was celebrated the 1st of November. Well, the church sees all these people who are celebrating these druid rituals, and they say, we got to fix that. Pope Gregory IV expanded All Martyrs Day to include all the saints, and he bumped it from May to the 1st of November. October 31st was All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Eve. November 1 was All Hallows' Day. November 2nd, All Souls' Day, which was the time they prayed the people in purgatory out of purgatory. It was another kind of a festival of the dead. Widely believed the church was attempting to replace the Celtic festival of the dead with a related but church-sanctioned holiday. And, you know, Christians are terrified of Halloween. They wouldn't dress their kids up with witches' hats on because this is a celebration of witchcraft. Anybody grow up in a conservative home like that? Any of you? A few of you? Couldn't do blood, you couldn't do monsters, you can't do skeletons, you can't do anything that's about scaring or dead or anything like that. So you make an alternative, like harvest parties instead of Halloween parties. This is just one brochure I found online. And if you look in the bottom right corner, you'll see an advertisement for something they call trunk or treat. It's actually a clever idea for those who are afraid of going door to door because they may not know the people in their neighborhood or they live in an unsafe neighborhood. They put together another way to bring people into a church environment and build a big wall around them. What they do is, is people decorate their cars and they fill their trunks with Halloween candy and then the kids show up in costume and they go trunk to trunk to trunk to trunk and fill their baskets. Here's an example of some trunk or treat stuff. The cars are actually decorated, and there are people going place to place. Here's a car that's got a skull hanging, a skeleton with some candy and pumpkins. This guy went all out and decorated his car completely. Think about the Christmas holiday, and you guys know a lot of this stuff, right? Jesus is the reason for the season. And then you say, well, actually. <laughs> Christmas tree you have up in your home on your celebration of Jesus is pagan. Evergreens used in pagan celebrations of the winter solstice and a reminder of the green plants that would one day return with the resurgence of the sun god. Not the sun, the sun. Balder, the Norse sun god, he had a special plant, the evergreen, according to Viking tradition. Yule logs in the fireplace as part of our celebration of Jesus. Well, those are pagan as well. Representations of the old English words heol, indicating the 12-day festival of Yule. They'd light the, the Yule logs and they'd party till the last ember went out. And that guided how long the party was going to be. Gift giving for Jesus? That's pagan. Dating back to the festival of Saturnalia and banned by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages because it was so pagan. December 25th, borrowed from the pagans. The winter solstice celebrated by the early Greeks Members of Rome's upper classes also celebrated the birthday of Mithra, the god of the unconquerable sun, not sun, on December the 25th. Christianity just grabbed it and used it and claimed it as their own. Stories like Noah's Ark, how original is that? Not so much. If you're familiar with the Sumerian flood myths, the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Babylonian gods grow irritated with humankind, one righteous guy. He builds an ark to carry family, friends, and animals. There's a global water event. There's a bird sent to find land. And afterwards, they sacrifice an animal. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Even Jesus is potentially an echo of previous deity figures like Osiris, who was killed, resurrected, and those baptized into his death and resurrection, they get saved in the afterlife. Romulus and Perseus, they were miraculously born of a virgin. Zalmoxis, his death and resurrection assured followers that they would live forever. The Sumerian goddess Inanna, executed by a hostile court in an underworld, her corpse was crucified, rose from the dead, ascended, and now reigns from heaven. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? There's a great book out called The Christian Delusion, Why Faith Fails. Dr. David Eller in chapter 1 talks about the cultures of Christianity 
and I'm going to show you exactly what Christianity is doing with all of these things that I've just shown you. The chapter says this, why don't these people, the people we're evangelizing to, accept Christianity? Why don't they accept it in the form that existing Christians practice and teach? I fear that discerning Christian proselytizers who've been doing this for much longer than atheist polemicists have discovered the answer, the answer that those who want to win the contest and to influence society must heed, namely, culture. To stay relevant, we must be culturally relevant. That's why when we see something successful in the world, we must do it ourselves. It's a weak and shameless attempt to stay culturally relevant. From the same chapter, Christianity has shown a nearly infinite capacity to multiply and morph, to fit its environment. It can accommodate or integrate almost any influence. In other words, the church looks up and says, why create mediocrity when you can copy genius? In closing, my friends, time and time again, and probably from here for the rest of our lives, we will see religion, Christianity, and other religions latching on to fads, fashion, styles, customs, and pop culture icons of the day, passing off its own wares as chief alternatives to what others have already done. And in almost every case, the idea or product presented will be anything but original, with perhaps one exception, original sin. Thank you all so much for having me out today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.